And so we're going to do our best to try and stay on top of this whole thing. But uh, there are no promises when it comes to talking this early in the morning. It's a pleasure and an honor to be with you. <clears throat> Getting ready to head back to Washington State. It does rain there all the time, constantly. I was telling my brother ahead of time. He says, the reason you say that is to keep people out of your state. <clears throat> but the reality is it does rain all the time. In fact, we had the, earlier this year, we had, I think we, we set a record. It was over 60 straight days. Well, that's not good when you're trying to stay on top of your emotions. But um, <clears throat> anyway, let's get working together here today. I want to make sure that we leave a lot of time at the end for us to have a, 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 an opportunity to have a conversation because I'm more interested in hearing from you probably than you are from hearing from me because I'm excited about the things that God is doing around the world. You want to change the microphone? Wonderful. Thank you. There we go. We'll go a bit of a different direction there. Because I think as we have all walked through the last couple of years together, the reality is I understand your pain and you understand mine. That there have been challenges that, that, that none of us foresaw coming. Uh, in Washington State, we were at the demographic epicenter of the COVID-19 pandemic, which means suddenly we found out on a Tuesday that everything was changing on Sunday, whether we wanted it to change or not. And the fascinating thing to me was this. I was actually convening a large group of pastors at that time. So we have about 19 pastors on staff at our church. And we were actually sitting down having a conversation about whether or not we should go with live stream or not. Apparently, Jesus didn't think very much of our conversation because he just instituted the plan and said, you're going live stream whether you want to go live stream or not. This is how this is going to work. And if you know anything about Washington, we were under some of the most um, restrictive uh, uh, guidelines and mandates that happened across the entire country. So we actually feel like we're just beginning to reemerge again this past Sunday at Easter. It actually felt like there were people back for the very first time in two and a half years. And there were many, many Sundays where it was myself, the tech director and two camera guys. And after you've done the same service live three or four times, they're not listening to you anymore. Anyway, they're just sitting there on their phones and it's like, give me something back. Like at least respond in some way. Every once in a while, just look at me and wave or smile. That, that would be helpful. But as we have kind of emerged out of this time, one of the themes that we continuously kept coming back to is no matter how separated we may feel, God is with us. No matter how, how much distance there may be. And there were times I had to remind myself. I walked into church one morning and our entire youth staff had pasted pictures on the backs of all of the seats to remind me that there were actually people on the other side of the camera. Because it was a challenge, I think, for all of us. But to be reminded constantly, and I would tell people this, I said, I know it looks like I'm here by myself, but I'm actually not. Because every time we come together, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all show up at the same time. So there's at least four in the same place at the same time in that we are incredibly grateful. And so today, as we just kind of open up, we're going to talk about the power of with, understanding how the power of the presence of God can actually revolutionize any room that we're in, no matter what it is that we are doing. And several weeks ago, my wife and I were, were um, sitting together in a room in our house. We call it the Jesus Room. It's not because it's full of crosses. It's just, uh, it's the nicest room in our home, and that's where Laurel and I go to pray together. And we spend time together. And as we were sitting there, Laurel um, uh, was given a word from Isaiah chapter 41. I'm going to talk about my wife a lot today. I wish she could have been here with us. But uh, she was sitting there and, and she actually opened her Bible and began to read Isaiah chapter 41. And by the time we got to the end of Isaiah 41, she said, this is what you're supposed to talk about in New York. Wow. And you understand very quickly, <laughs> if your wife says, this is what God told you to do, that's what you do. That's just how it works. <laughs> Right? That's just how it works. Uh, we agree. All God's people said amen. That's how it works. Okay. So, always, we have found a place of agreement. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so, we're reading Isaiah chapter 41, and that's what we're going to do. We're just going to walk through one chapter of Scripture today. I don't know if we're going to get through all 22 verses or not, um, or we're going to try and get through 22. There's a whole lot more that's in there. But we're going to take God's word very seriously, and we're going to start with these two words right here. Be silent, because I don't know about you, but that's an incredible challenge for me. I mean, at times, that feels like an impossible task, because there are voices inside of my head right now 
that are saying things like, Grant, don't be silent, talk more. And say something profound and try to be impressive and, and make a group of people like you at some level, like just do something with the time that you have. And yet God's word says right here at the very beginning that we're supposed to be silent. And I wonder if there is an issue with all of us today when it comes to being silent. I wonder if there's a level of fear that comes in with silence because we're not afraid or, or we're afraid of what might actually come into our mind if we actually quiet ourselves down enough and allow God an opportunity to speak. I wonder if I gave you 60 seconds to be completely quiet, I wonder what would compete for your attention. I wonder if your mind would drift very quickly to your calendar or your text messages or the, the piling number of email that just keeps, keeps pushing in on top of you as you have been here. I wonder whether or not expectations and deadlines and that fight that you had with your spouse on the way to the conference this morning would begin to, to, to push in on you. I wonder if you're still experiencing a pastoral hangover from Easter. I wonder if there's this nagging feeling of shame because... As Pastor Park continues to talk to us about the forgiveness of sin, I wonder if the domination of sin in our life begins to just push in and keep coming back over and over and over again. I wonder whether or not if we gave you 60 seconds to just listen to God, I wonder if you would forecast in your mind that he was either sad or mad with you. And I wonder whether or not um, you would struggle in the idea. I grew up in a very fundamental Baptist church, King James only. We preached the gospel of you are horrible a lot. That's why I've enjoyed listening to Pastor Park we, night after night after night because he reminds me of who I actually am in Christ. And, and this, is, this was my deduction at the end of my upbringing. God was either sad or mad with me 100% of the time. Mildly disappointed. And then I ran into the doxology in Jude chapter 20, or in Jude, well, there's only one chapter in Jude, but it's actually in verse 24, and I'm wondering whether or not this could help you just a little bit, because Scripture says this is actually God's position towards you today. And now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault, and here's the line that I love, and with great joy, Amen. and with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages now and forevermore. So I'm wondering if I gave you 60 seconds to just be quiet and you knew that God's position towards you was actually one of presenting you without judgment and with great joy. I wonder if you could spend that 60 seconds just enjoying God's presence instead of trying to do something or accomplish something. So let's actually take God's word seriously. And when he says, be silent, let's do that. So I'm going to give you 60 seconds. In the last time I did the empowerment talk, the number one complaint when we were done is that 60 seconds went way too fast. <laughs> but I wonder if we could discipline ourselves for 60 seconds. Let's just be quiet. Let's quiet our hearts before the Lord and see if maybe, just maybe, he would want to meet with us, and I wonder if we met with him just exactly what he would say. So let's take it. 60 seconds of quiet before the Lord just because he told us to. Father, we quiet our hearts so that we can hear you, and Lord, I pray that you would speak, because if you don't, this will be a glorious waste of time. 
Lord, you told us to be silent. We have done our best to be obedient. And now uh, lead us into this time, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Be silent before me, you islands. That's how the scripture goes. Apparently, God has a name for pastors and leaders on the front end. It's not a compliment. In fact, it's a bit of a struggle because I think God knows that each one of us has, has something inside of us that tends to pull away and isolate where we pull back and we just kind of want to do our own thing. And I have to ask myself a question today, and that is, am I an island? Have I separated myself? Am I on my own? Have I done that on purpose? Have I created my own little theological and geographical entity because I actually think I have something inside of me that can stand alone? Isn't it interesting that God would speak to that very readily in Scripture and say, apart from me, you can do nothing, not a little bit of something. Apart from me, you can do absolutely nothing. So God knows and has known all the way through Scripture that He wants to continue to speak to these islands and call us back together again. We do something in the county um, where I come from. It's called Pastors Praying for Pastors. We gather pastors on a regular basis to pray for each other. The only two agreements we make when we walk in the door is no one is going to give you any work that you didn't agree to, and you can't pray for your own church. You actually have to pray for somebody else's. And it's unleashed a movement of unity within our county because what I found when I got there is that we have a natural inclination as leaders, whether we, we know better, but we do it anyway, we tend to isolate and pull away. We become an island. That's why God's speaking to us. Be silent before me, you islands. Basically, be quiet, you little individualists, because I'm going to call you back together again. And isn't it interesting, when I'm an island, I live antithetically to the very prayer of Jesus from John 17. He said, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray for those who believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us, that they may believe that you've sent me. I've given them the glory you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that you may be brought into complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Me. I fall victim to this isolationist mentality all of the time. And yet what blows me away is every time I open my Bible, God keeps telling me, don't be alone. I am with you. I am with you. I am with you. I am with you. So I have to answer the question, am I an island? More times than I should be. And one of the reasons I showed up here is because I appreciate the fact that if, if, if I'm an island and you're an island and Jesus builds a bridge between the two of us, that we're not islands anymore. And we could actually move in the right direction. So how, how have we moved away from this island mentality? Well, I can tell you, for me, COVID has actually been an incredible blessing. Whether I wanted to or not, it slowed me down. It took away some of the platforms, which was actually really, really good. And it forced me into a prayer room with my wife and on FaceTime with my kids, which has been the greatest blessing. I've got two adult kids. They're both married. They're both gone. I have no grandchildren yet. I have four grand dogs. <clears throat> Thank you, Jesus, for those. But learning what it meant to not be isolationist, but to actually instead make simple choices, like choosing to be present, like choosing to actually be in a room that I was in instead of allowing my mind to disappear somewhere else, to choose to connect, to do more listening than talking, to pray together. I, I, I am absolutely amazed at the number of people, married people that I talk to and I say, how much, time of, how much time do you spend intentionally praying together with your spouse? And the answer most of the time is we rarely do that. So you were created to be one flesh. God puts you together and you don't pray together. Why? And here's the number one reason, because I'm afraid of what God might say to us together. Isn't that interesting? Because I'm afraid of what God might say to us together. Here's a thought. What if he said the same thing to you at the same time? The place of agreement is the place of power. How beautiful would that be if God whispered the same thing to a husband that he did to a wife, and then you came into unity and actually did that together? Can you imagine what would happen in our churches if husbands and wives actually learned to listen to God together? Huh. 
I'm glad there's desks here because some of the husbands and wives, your elbows can't reach right now all the way, which is good. Be silent before me, you islands. Let the nations renew their strength. Let them come forward and speak. Let's meet together at the place of judgment. I don't know about you, but I don't want to meet at the place of judgment. I want to meet at the place of accolades and esteem. I want, I want to meet in that place of, of enjoyment and pleasure. I don't have time for judgment because when I meet at the place of judgment, it assumes that I've had something that I've done something that actually needs to be judged. It's not my favorite place to go. But then this question comes in. Oh, what happened? There we go. Who has stirred up one from the east, calling him in righteousness to his service? He hands nations over to him and subdues kings before him. He turns them to dust with his sword, to wind-blown chaff with his bow. He pursues them and moves on unscathed, by a path his feet have not traveled before. Can let's, let's, we have got to stop there for just a second. When I read that verse, I was struck by this word, unscathed. I don't know of a single pastor or leader who came through the pandemic unscathed. We all have marks, right? We've got the marks of people's opinions. We've got the emails to prove it. We've got people who used to come and didn't come. I remember sitting down in front of one family and saying, so... Let me understand this. I helped your husband get out of his porn addiction. I married, I married your daughter. I helped your daughter when she was dating an atheist. I've done marriage counseling with you more times than I can, than I can count. I've served your family to the very best of my ability. And now you're leaving because some people in the building are wearing a piece of cloth over their face. Really? Apparently, I'm a disposable shepherd after 20 years. We all have the marks. We all have the bruises of what we have come through. We all have had to, to stand in front of people that we love and gave our lives for, and they just said, sorry, pastor, it's not enough. Unless you do this this way or do that that way, unless you take my position with masks, vaccines, and all of this other kind of stuff that's going on, you don't get to be my shepherd anymore. What a tragedy. Did anybody else learn during the pandemic that sheep bite? Sheep have teeth. They'll take a chunk out of you given an opportunity. It's a difficult thing to try and wrap your head around. We all have scars. Let's stop, let, let's stop, let's stop, and, or stop and talk about this scathing idea of scars for just a moment. So this past Easter, I had an opportunity to, to preach from John chapter 20. I love John chapter 20 because it starts with the resurrection of Jesus. It's always a great place to start preaching. I mean, if you're going to preach anything, preach the resurrection power of Jesus. It's absolutely incredible. And then at the end of chapter 20, this story happens, and I just... I love, so, so one of my closest friends is actually an atheist. He thinks I'm crazy, but it drives him crazy because he goes, he goes, you're the craziest person I know who has more peace than I've ever experienced. <laughs> and I was like, well, that's kind of, that, that's kind of cool. Ty's actually the head of a local atheist society, and we have this amazing conversation back and forth all of the time. And, and, uh, and, and, and as, as we were talking about belief, I said, you know, there's actually a lot of people in the Bible that understand exactly where you're coming from, my friend. And if you get to the end of John chapter 20, you actually run into these people. The Bible says, now Thomas, one of the 12, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I seal the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. You know, sometimes seeing is believing, Right. I mean, the very eyes that Thomas saw, the crucifixion of Jesus, were the eyes that he wanted to testify. And so he said, I'm going to need some proof. I need Jesus to show up here, hold out his hand. I want to stick my finger in that nail hole, and then I will actually be convinced. Thomas needed to see it. He wanted to see that Jesus hadn't just survived, but that he was actually thriving, that he was breathing and eating and walking and talking. I mean, he needed full, uh, full testimony that, that, that everything that Jesus said was going to happen actually did happen. He, he wanted to know whether or not Jesus and Paul were, were right when they said, where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin. Power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So then at the end, he says, I'm not going to believe unless I see it. And then this happens a week later. 
His disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came in, stood among them, and said, Peace be with you. For some of you, that's the most important message you could hear this week. Peace be with you. Amen. You're good. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand, put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. That's why scars matter. Have you ever wondered why Jesus was resurrected with scars? I mean, I mean, if you think about it, if you think about it, God could have raised Jesus from the dead in pristine condition, completely unmarked. Like, I'm going to restore him back to the original condition. But instead, Jesus keeps his scars. And I believe this is why scars matter. It's not to remind us of the hurt. It's to remind us of the healing that only God can accomplish. I mean, do you remember what Thomas said before the scar showed up? I will not believe. And then the scar showed up, and this... This man who professed disbelief suddenly is believing. Listen to his testimony. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you've seen me, you've believed. Blessed are those who've not seen, but have believed. I mean, belief embraces the scars of Jesus. That's why the Apostle Paul says, from now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. I like that line. That's a good pastoral line. Let no one cause me trouble. Like, can everyone just give me a break? Like, everyone just step away. How about everybody, how about everybody this week just says, I love the sermon? <laughs> I love that part of it. Let's keep going. So, who has done this and carried it through? Calling forth the generation from the beginning, the Lord with the first of them and with the last. I am he. I mean, this is where we can get into trouble, but we got to take a moment here because it's just so important to be able to say it, right? Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Christ. Jesus has carried all of his scars and he's been triumphant. He's over all and above all. Jesus is our pastor. The only org chart you need in your, in your church is the fact that Jesus is in the top box and everybody else is below him. We already have a shepherd. We already have a pastor. So the rest of us don't need to aspire to that particular job portfolio. He's got it completely taken care of. And now he's going to come back and talk to the islands again. The islands have seen it in fear. The ends of the earth tremble. They approach and come forward. They help each other and say to their companions, be strong. Now, pay attention to what's going to happen next. The metal worker encourages the goldsmith. And the one who smooths with the hammer spurs on the one who strikes the anvil. One says of the welding, it's good. The other nails down the idol so it will not topple. At first glance, you start reading this, and it looks like a lesson in encouragement. Like there's a bunch of craftsmen, and they're cheering each other on. Like, oh, that's a really good weld. Oh, you did a fantastic job smoothing out that metal. This looks so good. Everything is great. Unless you look at the context and you realize something. They're building idols. Don't we do the same? I mean, I don't know about you, but as a leader, sometimes I find my worth in attendance and finances. I mean, I wonder how many of us, if we were, I mean, if we were really, really honest, would have to say, oh, I've become a master of the systems in the family of God while I've been completely neglecting the family God gave me at home. We build our idols on reputation and networks and platforms. We build bigger buildings and we completely ignore the parable where Jesus says, oh yeah, there was this guy who kept building bigger and bigger barns and one night his soul was required of him. And it, it always just freaks me out when I see it. But there, God has a name for that guy who builds bigger things for the sake of building bigger. He calls him a fool. I think we all fall into this trap, which means we're going to take another little side road. I love rabbit trails, in case you haven't noticed. Psalm 27, David asks a question. The question is, what is your one thing? David answers his own question, and this is what he says. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and seek him in his temple. David says, the only thing I want is the presence of God. That's it. 
I want to be in his presence, sit in his presence, live in his presence, thrive in his presence. I want to do everything in his presence. He says, that's the one thing I ask, to actually just be in your presence. So I'm going to ask you the question, what's your one thing? I mean, if you had to boil it down, what is your one compelling need and purpose from God today? I've been thinking a lot about that question, and I am shocked and somewhat ashamed at some of my answers. One thing I ask, God, um, if a donor could show up and wipe out the debt, that would be fantastic. Just that one thing. One thing I ask that, um, my God, if the room could fill back up again, that would, that would be great because I just wouldn't feel so alone anymore. God, one thing I ask, could there be no more funerals for the rest of the year? It's been too many. Got a couple of, a couple of other things on my one thing list. I mean, if life could be easier and the deal would close and the sales would increase and the kids would stay out of trouble, if the virus could go away, that would be fantastic. If the check would clear, the country would survive, the markets could, would go up so one day I could retire. Like, God, just one thing. David's one thing was simple. I just want to be in God's presence. When I looked at my list of one things, and wasn't it interesting that there was more than one thing on my list? (laughs) Practicing the presence of God used to be way down here, but praise God, it's beginning to move higher up the list. In this world of of pastoring and leading, it's so easy to allow something to be your one thing instead of close communion with the someone who holds everything. Do we understand that? Seeking God and being in his presence, that, that is that one thing. So I'm asking not what will be your one thing tomorrow, but what will be your one thing Today, we better keep moving or we're going to run out of time. But you, O Israel, my servant Jacob, whom I've chosen, you descendants of Abraham, my friend, I took you from the ends of the earth, from as farthest corners I called you. I said, you are my servant. I have chosen you and not rejected you. So we're turning a corner into a different kind of, uh, into a, a different kind of encouragement. And I want you to think about this for just a second. The people in this room. Many of us have the mindset that we suffered through the pandemic. What if we flipped that script over and we looked at it differently? What if I said it to you this way? God chose you to lead his family through the midst of a global pandemic. You were chosen. You were selected to be at the helm in a time of unprecedented change. I'm not going to pretend that our pandemic was any was any worse than any other pandemic the world has faced because it has faced many other ones. But what if we flip the script? What if you weren't the victim in the story and instead you became a part of the king's plan as a part of the story? So let me say it to you again. You were chosen to be at the helm, to be leaders of God's family in the midst of a season of unprecedented chains. He chose you. Of all the people he could have picked and he picked you. God must think an awful lot of you to allow you to carry that weight. It's interesting that it talks here about, um, if you look back in the last verse, it was talking about opposition. As soon as I say the word opposition, I can only think of one person, and that's um, the girl that I happen to be married to. I talk about her every opportunity that I have because, honestly, she's one of the most fearless people that I've ever met. So my wife has Bietti's crystalline dystrophy and cystoid macular edema, two eye conditions that I wish I knew nothing about. She's legally blind. When she was pregnant with our son, Braden, who's now uh, well, going to be 29 years old in September, um, when she was pregnant with Braden, she actually complained to one of the tech guys at, her, at the office where she worked that part of her screen wasn't working on her computer screen. And they came in and took a look at the screen, and they said, there's nothing wrong with your screen. Everything looks perfect. And then she realized that the problem wasn't with her computer to monitor. It was actually uh, with her eyes. So my wife is legally blind, and she could choose every day to allow the weight of the physical opposition that she faces to completely take her out. 
If if the flips were if the scripts were flipped and I had what she had, I think you'd find me in a corner curled up in a little ball. <laughs> Does she grow weary every day of trying to fight for everything she sees? Yes. Has she lost heart? Absolutely not. In fact, I will share what she said to me the other night. She said, while I am still praying for my miracle every day, Bietti's crystalline dystrophy has given me far more than it's taken it away. You know how she can feel that way? Because she lives for one thing every single day, and that's to be in the presence of God. And that helps her overcome absolutely everything. Let's keep on going, verse 10. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. That is a promise that every single one of us should hold on to. And so we talked about at the beginning, this is the power of with, God's presence along with us. So here's what we're going to do. In the middle of, uh, I've lost track of the days, in the middle of April, we're actually going to talk about Christmas. Because when you talk about God being with his people, it's embedded within the story of the incarnation. So we were all born with this deep need and longing for connection, right? It's hardwired into our soul, even for introverts like me. People go, you're an introvert? I'm like, yeah, you have no idea. I get paid to be an extrovert. <laughs> Christy's been my host. She understands. Given an opportunity, I'm going to go by myself. I'm going to walk away into a corner. <laughs> People with words scare me, okay? That's how it works. And yet God keeps coming back and saying this to people over and over again. In fact, it's one of the most prominent statements all the way through Scripture. I am with you. I am with you. I will be with you. I love biblical history because I love seeing how God was with people through time past. So let me just give you a couple of examples. So Adam, Genesis chapter 3, verse 8. In the very beginning, God was with Adam and Eve. He walked with them in the garden. He was with his people, and his people were with him. A guy named Enoch. Genesis 5, 24, Enoch walked with God and then was no more because God took him away. God walked so closely with Enoch. One day they went for a walk. God looked at Enoch and said, hey, guess what? We're closer to my house than yours. You want to come home? Let's just keep walking. Noah, Genesis 6, verse 9, Noah was a righteous man, blameless among all the people of his time, and he walked with God. According to scripture, the world was wicked, right? Noah could have walked with the cultural flow of evil, but instead he walked the opposite direction and God was with him. Abraham, Genesis 17. Abraham's 99 years old. God shows up and says, I am God Almighty. Walk with me and before me and be blameless as for me. This will be my covenant with you and you will be a father of many nations. A guy named Joseph, right? Genesis 39. God was with Joseph in the good times. The Bible said that the Lord was with Joseph and he prospered. And then his life begins to fall apart. And over and over and over again, God keeps saying, I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm with you. So like I said before, one of my closest friends is an atheist. He was actually my sermon consultant when I did a series called Bent on the Life of Joseph. My buddy Ty read the entire story of Joseph. He comes back to me and he goes, Grant, this is my conclusion. If God's presence gets you where Joseph ended up in prison, I don't want God to be with me. I don't want God to be with me. If you end up being best friends with a warden and you're inside the jail, I don't want, I'm not interested in being with God. In fact, he goes, if I was Joseph, this is what I would have said. Hey, God, go be with my brothers. Go be with the, with the guys who threw me in the hole, right? And yet over and over again, it says, in the presence of God was with him. Joshua, preparing to take some new territory. He's getting ready to take brand new captive. And the Bible says, have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you. David's getting ready for a building project. His friend Nathan, who's been with him through challenges and victories, comes to him and says, whatever you have in mind, go ahead and do it. The Lord is with you you over and over and over again the lord is with you it's interesting i selected every one of those biblical characters out of one chapter in scripture it's actually the genealogy of jesus and pretty much through the entire genealogy you can go all the way through and you will find a corresponding verse that goes along with every single character where god stated that he would be with him. And then he shows up to Joseph and Mary, 
and the embodiment of everything that we know to be true following Jesus is summarized in the name that they give their son. And you will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. He's with you. I mean, think about it for just a second, right? Joseph has to do the unthinkable. Suddenly, he's got a scandal on his hand. The Bible says that Joseph was Sadiq, which means he was a holy and righteous young man. He stood for the right things, and suddenly, his betrothed, his fiance, is pregnant with no explanation other than it's God's. Kind of a difficult story, right? And the pressure and the scrutiny begins to push into him, uh, push in on top of Joseph. And yet, what does the angel say? Don't be afraid to take Mary home with you, his wife, for what is born and conceived in her. He's going to save his people from their sins. And oh, by the way, he's got this beautiful name. He's with you. Which means, Joseph, he's with you right now. Mary, he's with you right now in the midst of everything that's going on. Don't be afraid. Stick together because... He is with you. Sometimes um, snowstorms in Saskatchewan are dangerous. So I grew up in Manitoba. I'm a Canadian kid originally. I was a military kid from Germany, then got moved to Brandon, Manitoba. Married a girl from Saskatchewan. And I will never forget, prairie storms are dangerous. In fact, you can die if you're not prepared for them. So you need to have the right equipment in your car. You need to make sure that you're all taken care of. And one weekend when I was dating my wife, Laurel, she actually went home for the weekend to teach Sunday school. That was part of her, her Christian service, as it was one of, her quali- um, one of the, the requirements for school. And there was a really, really wicked storm. An amazing blizzard blew in. Yes, she wanted to come back to campus, but, and I like to think it was because she missed me. Um, but she probably just wanted to come back to campus. And so she left her farm, which was an hour, it was about an hour's drive from her farm all the way back to the school where we were both attending. And the storm was wicked. Snow, ice, no visibility, can't see anything. I mean, it's, it's like there's a wall of white in front of your vehicle. You can't see anything. Whiteouts are dangerous and people die. That's what it was. Laurel jumped in her car anyway, and she was driving a 1970 Pontiac Acadian for the car uh, aficionados. It was like Canada's version of the Chevy Nova. It was actually a beautiful car. So she jumped in, and she started heading back towards school. And for a long time, she battled ice and snow and wind for more than an hour. It took her an incredibly long time to get back to campus. Driving was treacherous and scary. And she noticed as she had been driving that there was a car following her. And that's often what happens when you're in the middle of a blizzard. You'll clump up together in a group of cars and travel together because it's safer. And so she thought this car behind her was actually following her to stay safe and maintain, you know, a safe distance. But they were just trying. She could just barely see the headlights. And then something happened. When she got to the campus, she was going to turn left into the school. And she realized that the headlights behind her had actually pulled into the turning lane. And as she pulled into campus, the headlights flipped around and made a U-turn and started heading in the other direction. And she recognized the headlights. Her dad had followed her all the way to school. And as soon as he knew his little girl was safe, he went all the way back the other direction in this storm. Do you know why he did that? Because that's what good fathers do. And you have a good father. And he is with you. I love that God lives up to his name, Emmanuel, God with us. And there's so much that we could say about that, but we better keep moving. All who rage against you will surely be ashamed and disgraced. Those who oppose you will be as nothing and perish. Though you search for your enemies, you will not find them. Those who war against you will be nothing at all. Can we stop here for just a second and be reminded? I've had to do a brain shift in my mind of people who during the pandemic made me a very convenient enemy and disappeared or walked out the door. Can I tell you what I've learned about these verses about looking for my enemies and who deciding who actually qualifies as an enemy and who doesn't? I'll put it this way. Anyone who left your church, they're not your enemy. They're a victim of the enemy. And whether we like it or not, the Bible says, forgive as the Lord forgave you. 
The Bible says we can leave room for God's wrath. And I don't know about you, sometimes I'm praying for a lot of room, just being honest. And then we need to be reminded again that vengeance is his, not ours, and that's not the goal. Because the Bible also says, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Boy, isn't it hard to live in that tension sometimes. Here's what I love, what comes next. For I am the Lord, your God, who takes hold of your righteous hand, your right hand and says to you, do not fear. <clears throat> I will help you. That is an encouragement to me. That's an encouragement to me. That means God is going to help me figure out how the church fits into the new metaverse. I actually did... <laughs> I did a tour of a digital campus with an avatar <laughs> connecting to a group of, of, of students who are living in this thing that's now called the metaverse. And you can actually create a church campus in the metaverse that's completely attended by, by avatars who actually play worship from the front. And then your little avatar gets up and preaches. And it was the most interesting strange thing I have ever seen and when the young lady who was doing the tour showed me she goes this is one of the fastest growing platforms in the world for 14 to 18 year olds and I'm thinking God can help us figure that out I, mean, I don't know how to do it but God could help us figure out how are we going to reach them there He's going to help us with the new reality and the new metrics He's going to help in fact listen to what comes next don't be afraid and I love his language here. You worm, Jacob. <laughs> That's kind of how it feels some days. Don't be afraid, you worm, Jacob. Little Israel, do not fear, for I myself will help you. Declares the Lord your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. See, I will make you into a threshing sledge, new and sharp with many teeth. You will thresh the mountains and crush them and reduce the hills to chaff. You will winnow them and the wind will pick them up and a gale will blow them away, but you will rejoice in the Lord and glory in the Holy One of Israel. A threshing sledge was a wooden sled that was outfitted with metal teeth. They would drag it across ripe grain that was laid on the ground. The grain would fall through and they would reap a beautiful and wonderful harvest. You know what I love about this? It says God's going to give us a different kind of teeth that we're going to need in order to chew up all of the opportunities that God's going to put in front of us. You know what else I love about it? The sledge, the sledge sings. I don't know about you, but I've discovered that worship is a weapon. And when I worship God in spirit and in truth, it's amazing what just falls away. We'll finish with this. The poor and needy search for water, but there is none. Their tongues are, their tongues are parched with thirst, but I, the Lord, will answer them. I, the Lord God of Israel, will not forsake them. I will make rivers flow on barren heights and springs within the valleys. I will turn the desert into pools of water and the parched ground into springs. I will put in the desert the cedar and the acacia, the myrtle and the olive. I will set junipers in the wasteland and the fir and the cypress together. God is saying here that he's not only going to refresh people, he's also going to reforest. God's on a reforestation project, which means there are many small trees that need to be nurtured and grown right now because God is creating a brand new day. And now here's the last piece. Tell us, you idols, what's going to happen? Tell us what the former things were so that we may consider them and know their final outcome or declare to us the things to come. God calls the idols to account. He goes, all of the things that you say you know you actually don't know. You know, it's in, isn't it interesting that idolatry almost always is reflected in the present but has some level of reflection also from the past? Think about all of the things that used to be important to us, right? During the pandemic, we actually celebrated the fact that we paid off our building. How ironic is that? Because it's, <laughs> it's irrelevant, we paid off a building that no one was coming to anymore. We've been spending up, praise God for the fact that he took the debt away. We could spend all that mortgage money on, on new ministry. But think about how ironic that is. We paid for something we don't use as much. We had to have a whole different conversation. How are we going to turn our church into a community center? 
How are we going to kick the doors open so we can get the group, the families that live around us to come in inside of this building because we're not using it in the way that we used to use it? What, a, what an incredible opportunity that is. But think about that, the idolatry of building status, size, and security. And God keeps calling us away from those idols and saying, it's okay that they are there, but never mistake them for the kingdom. Don't ever lose sight of the kingdom. My friend John McCallway, who ministers in Africa, sent me a picture the other day. We had, the, we, we had the most amazing thing. John reached out to us. He never asks for anything. He works in uh, the Maasai land territory, Kenya and Tanzania. I love John and Jacinta McCallway. They are just like some of my, they're just dear heroes of God. I want to be there when they get home to heaven because that party will be incredible. And John had said, we discovered a village, they, 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 they know nothing about Jesus. Nothing, nothing, nothing. He goes, they have a well, but the wellhead is broken. Do you know anybody that would like to buy a wellhead? The question was, well, how much is the wellhead going to cost? A thousand bucks. Guess what showed up that Sunday morning? A couple from our church walks up and just says, you know what? God just told us we're supposed to do something. Here's a thousand bucks. You'll know where to put it. Huh. Sent it to John. They fixed the wellhead, and it shouldn't surprise any of us that the story of the leadership of that town was we were praying that if God was real, he would bring water back to our village. Started with a wellhead, now there's a school, now there's a church. I mean, and it, the ripples just keep going further and further and further. Because God keeps calling us into these moments where we don't idolize the stuff or we begin to grab a hold of what's truly happening inside of the kingdom. I'll close with this and then hopefully we'll have an opportunity to talk for a few minutes. I read this piece the other day from author Susie Larson and it spoke to me and it so profoundly ties into the end of Isaiah chapter 41. We love our comfort... God prefers our faith. We love predictability. God invites us on an adventure. We want relief. God wants redemption. We want a break. God's after a breakthrough. Hidden in every circumstance is an opportunity to experience God, to engage our faith, and to see Him move. More often than not, we ask too little of God. He is greater, grander, and more magnificent than we can imagine, and he wastes nothing. He's using every nuance of your story to make you into someone you never dreamed you could be. So today, pray big, dream big, take risks, and Jesus will lead you on the path of your best life as he is with you. So as we started... We began with 60 seconds of silence. And we're going to do it again. Because <laughs> I wonder now, as God has, has hopefully spoken to us in some way, that we could take a moment and just reflect on what he might say to us. If we gave him 60 seconds of our undivided attention, if we refuse to allow the email list and the pressure and all of the things that we're facing today to crowd out his voice. But if we gave him 60 seconds of our full undivided attention, I wonder what he might say. Let's take 60 seconds and do exactly that.
Father, we thank you for your presence that you are with us. And may we fully enter into the power of a union with you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'll be so bold as to ask. We've got about four minutes left to go. What did God say to you? What did you hear? I would love to hear from just a few of you. I know God is, my wife challenged me one time. She said, you know, Grant, because people come all the time and say, you know, God's just so silent. He's just quiet all the time. He doesn't answer me. And she goes, I want you to think about that for just a second. Because she goes, if, if Braden and McKenna, so those are my kids, if they came up to you and just said, Daddy, I have a question, would you sit there and just stare at them in silence? I said, of course not. He goes, and, and God's a better father than you are. I believe God is always speaking continuously. So I would love to know from anybody in the room at all, what did God say to you when you gave him 60 seconds of your undivided attention? We need to do more of this? Isn't that always the way it seems to be? That was the number, like I told you at the beginning, the number one complaint from when we did this talk on Tuesday, 60 seconds was not nearly long enough. So what if today your one thing was to find strategic time quietly away on your own and just say, God, speak to me? I think he would answer that prayer every time. Father God, would you speak to me? I think his answer would be yes. Thank you for sharing that. That's good. Yes. Yeah, that, that idea of being chosen, I remember when that first thought of it, when I first, that kind of popped into my brain, it's just like, no, God, you know, <laughs> you're not a victim in this whole pandemic thing. God chose you to lead strong through this. So pick up the mantle and lead. Let's go. Find some new opportunities. Did any of us like Zoom? No, we all hated Zoom. <laughs> but... Do you know what? You want to know what Zoom created? So this is amazing. So I do this little YouTube show on Jesus.net. Jesus.net is an amazing ministry. They're one of the largest evangelical um, web presences in the world that nobody knows about. But if you you Google Jesus.net, you'll find some incredible stuff. And I get to do this little live Q&A show. I met a guy on the Q&A show named Michael from London. Then Michael started coming to church virtually from London, England, and then he showed up in a baptism class. So we couldn't bring him to Bellingham, so his wife baptized him on a Zoom screen in his flat in London, and our church went nuts. <laughs> Incredible. And you, you, you wanna know how, 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 this is my understanding of the story of how Michael found us. His son had committed suicide and he was brokenhearted, so he just started Googling answers to life, and that's how he, that's how he stumbled across that. God has a plan. That's good. Yes, what did you hear? Don't worry, Jesus, I'm with you. Yeah. Isn't it amazing how the presence of God makes all of that other stuff just kind of disappear? It's like debt is not a big deal to a God who owns everything, <laughs> right? But to know the presence of God is so practical in every different way. Awesome. Somebody else? Yeah. Yeah. right now. Amen. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing. That's good. 
Our time is gone. I wish we had more time to connect and go through that, but we'll be around the rest of the day. Thank you so much. Let's pray together as we leave. Father God, as we go from here, I pray that your presence would become more and more clear to us. Lord, that we would become more aware of your presence, knowing that you, you are with us and have chosen us today. So God, may we embrace that with all that we have. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for coming.